So help me and walk me back, Joan Stefan Brand. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Actually, don't, ch- don't check my website for what's happening in my, in my life right now because I'm not technologically aware or skilled or <laughs> anything. So it was done like years ago and every once in a while a little thing gets added. So just call me if you want to know what I'm up to. Um, he also was talking about Guy Arusha coming in next week who is this wonderful, cool, calm dude. I am not a cool, calm dude. <laughs> so, so apologies for whatever happens today. Um, in fact, I was just asked to write something for somebody else's blog and they asked me to come up with a name for a rock band if I was going to be a rock star. And then the name of my rock band is Fizzgig. Anybody know that name? Know that word? No, I love that. It's only in a few dictionaries, but I found it like decades ago. And Fizzgig means giddy, restless female. That's what I am. It's like giddy in a good way. Like, yeah, I want to have fun and I want to laugh, but I also want to be deep and I can be anything I want. And restless because I don't feel like I'm ever quite satisfied with where I am. It's not like I'm always seeking, but I'm always finding. So I want to be restless. I want my nature to be restless like that. So I am a fizz gig. Um, So that's also me. I'm a dandelion. We want to talk about, well, actually, first of all, first of all, I do this every time when I speak. So I know I did it here when I spoke here like seven or eight years ago. I'm going to do it again. If everybody could just take a deep breath at once, hold it for just a moment, and lower your expectations. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's for me. <laughs> That's for me. Um, I was going to reference the dandelion, you know, because the, the theme this month is, okay, I wrote it down. I don't have it with me. Service as spiritual practice. I believe that's accurate. Service as spiritual practice. And one of the reasons I have a dandelion up there is, bye, Isla. That's my granddaughter leaving noisily, but not, not so noisily. Um, One reason I have a dandelion up there is because I do believe I am a dandelion in many ways. Um, Dandelions are of tremendous service to our world. If you've done any study on dandelions at all, you know that they're medicine. They're they're, um, impossible to get rid of because they are medicine. Um, In fact, there was a guy I was reading, I don't know his name, but he was working at the FDA and he was interviewed drinking a cup of Creeping Charlie tea. Gotta love a guy who lo- drinks a cup of Creeping Charlie tea. And he said, anything that the earth offers plentifully is there for a reason and for its medicine. So what, when you look at the dandelion, I want you to think like, it's the lowly dandelion, right? It's just a dandelion. They're everywhere. And we don't necessarily respect them or honor them for what their gift is, but they have a tremendous, tremendous gift. Um, And I think we're all a little bit like dandelions. We maybe kind of discount ourselves and wonder, you know, why we're here and there are so many of us and nothing seems to be changing, But, but think about the dandelion. It will not be gotten rid of. How many times have back, probably not this group, you're probably not out there killing dandelions, right? (laughs) <laughs> but, <laughs> but think about how many times you've seen people just spraying and digging and, you know, and it's like this, it's like Sisyphus rolling a rock up a hill, you know, it's not going to go away, but yet we dig and we try to get rid of whatever we think isn't part of the, you know, the, the calming, cool landscape that we, you know, that so many people want to have. Um, Be a dandelion is one of my bottom lines today. Be a dandelion. And when I say be a dandelion, it's it's responding to your own... Entelechy is the word that that I've been using lately. And it's an old, old word. It's a Latin word, entelechy. And what it is is your pure potential. It's the absolute seed of potential that you were born with. And everybody has an entelechy. The dandelion has the entelechy to possibly become a dandelion. Of course it will, because they're everywhere. The pine tree has the entelechy. The pine cone has the entelechy of possibly 
becoming a pine tree. You know, the little birch, I don't know what they are, but they're so cute and they're coming out now in the spring. <laughs> Every single one of those little seeds on a birch tree has the intelligence, the potential to become who, you, who it is. You know, a pine cone could try as hard as it wanted to to become a birch tree. It's never going to happen. So I think one of the most comforting and powerful things you can do to be of service is to recover and remember your entelechy. And you might go, you know, well, it's to be a human. It's like, yeah, but like what kind of human? They're, you know, we're all so different. If you, if you polled this group in here about what they loved and how they wanted to spend their time, there'd probably be some crossover, but there'd also be some really specific, unique characteristics and joys and desires. So to own your potential. I usually, when I speak, I always say I'm going to start at the end of my speech, so I'll start at the end of my speech. The end of my speech which I also don't like to call a speech because I'm kind of afraid of public speaking, but hey, that's another story. <laughs> um, the end of my speech is, remember who you are, and be who you are, and share who you are. And if you want to shift the world, that's how we shift the world. And this was, a, this was um, I'm 63 and a half years old, so this has been a long time coming to get to this place. I lived a good chunk of my life not thinking that I belonged, not thinking that I had anything to offer the world because I couldn't find how I fit with other people. It felt like the culture was telling me one thing and I was way over here thinking and feeling something different. I felt so alone in my life for so long. And the weirdest thing from a cultural perspective is that I had somehow achieved almost everything that the culture said, oh yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. That's, that's, that's what success is. I mean, I had, I, had had, I had had jobs on television for most of my working life. And for some people, they thought, whew, that is success. I mean, I worked as a news anchor for 17 years at CARE 11. I was a TV host for HGTV for 10 years, and the show ran for 13. I have a beautiful family. I had a nice car. I had a cabin. It's like, you know, I had success. This was it. What was that? And still, I had this sense of like, oh no. Now, now I have what, I said, what they said I was supposed to have, and I don't feel like I have. It felt like I just had a, a hole, and I kept, I kept considering that, I kept thinking that I was the absence of good qualities which is a really terrible idea to have and to nurture. Um, and at one point, I, I came to a point where it was bothering me so much that these were the feelings I had, not realizing they were, they were the feelings that were meant to drive me forward and to move me to a different place, into a different thought form. <clears throat> but I sat down on a plane, uh, coming back from Puerto Rico. Great trip, blue skies, sandy beaches, Pina coladas, the whole bag, you know, but still not feeling like, you know, it was like, yeah, that was fun, but, you know, it's like to, ooh, to really get in there and to really feel the joy of something. It's like, where was that? Why don't I feel that? And so I, I um, took out a little yellow legal pad and I started writing my life story. It was going to be the autobiography of Joan Stefan Brandmeier and, you know, it was going to be a thousand pages and start with... You know, she was born in Cambridge, no, Minneapolis, raised in Cambridge, and it just, it didn't, it didn't happen that way. Um, I wrote for a half an hour, I didn't write it. I can say that to this group, <laughs> and I say it to almost every group I speak at. Some, some people look like, you didn't write it? No, I don't think I wrote it. I put a pen near a, pa a paper, and the words fell off the pen, and they were written for me. That's how it felt. And it went for about a half an hour. It was beautiful, wonderful, lovely. I started to get an idea of what the issue was in my life, and then it stopped. And I did not pick up that little legal pad for five years, and I had lived a pretty challenging five years that 
if you, if you understand, well, this is my life, I can't make the judgment for anybody else's life, but the, the challenging years are the years when you're building your, your spiritual muscle, I guess. It's like going to the gym, and it's like sometimes you build your muscles to the point where they just are so weak, they don't feel like they can do anything. And those were the five years of, that was the five years of my life. Um, I had lost my sister, my dad was, was um, you know, he had a, there was a surgical accident, he died, I ended up in court in my sister's, um, because of my sister's estate. And, but then one day after all that kind of settled down, I thought about the legal pad and I went upstairs and I pulled it out and the exact same thing happened. It was like a half an hour later, after more words falling on the tablet, I had my story, and it had come out like a metaphor, a little tiny metaphor, and all of a sudden I knew what had been missing from my life. And if you don't mind, I am going to read it to you right now. It's called, And She Sparkled. And you will notice, this, by, this is the debut of the, we, I usually just read it and you don't see any of the drawings. So, ta-da! <laughs> Instead of doing like one of those. <laughs> um, and you will notice, I hope, that there are dandelions all over this book. Because they're super cool. There once was a little girl, and she sparkled. She did. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> she lived in her magnificence, singing and dancing wherever life took her. In the morning, a finger of sunlight would touch, would reach gently through the blinds to tickle her awake, and she would leap from her bed, looking for joy wherever she could find it. And she found it with her toes in the grass, her tiny hands around a dandelion, her hair tangled from the possibilities for fun that swirled around her. She was enough. At night, she would snuggle under her covers, barely able to wait for the dreams that would take her to even greater places and set the stage for the next day. One morning, though, the sunlight felt sharp, stabbing at sleepy eyes. A little grumble escaped her mouth as she stumbled out of bed, and she did dance that day, but not as joyfully, not as she had the day before. And that night, she punched at her pillow, waiting for sleep to take her away from the day. Away. Slowly, the people around her noted with pride that the little girl was growing up, learning to act mature is what they called it. They were doing their jobs well. And so the little girl became a big girl, nicely folding her hands in her lap as she sat very still, wondering why she felt so alone. There was still a part of her that felt like dancing and singing, but that wasn't acceptable most of the time. It might disturb someone, it might not be appropriate, it most certainly wasn't useful. So as the girl grew, she would lock the door of her room when the others left and sing and dance and visit the little girl inside, being careful to be a little quiet so she could hear if anyone returned. And the girl grew and became ever more dutiful. No one saw her dance, no one heard her sing. She memorized the answers others gave her for who she was, and soon, it seemed, even she forgot her little girl. To be sure, there were days when it looked as though the girl was happy, but the smiles, they were usually on the outside and not the inside. Life went on for the girl, now a woman, and her life looked a lot like everyone else's. She was told that was success. Life, they said, is all about fitting in. Don't ask questions. It makes us all a little uncomfortable, and you don't want that. So the woman spent her days waking up and waiting to fall asleep. She wasn't aware the little girl was patiently waiting for her, reaching out in small ways every day and every night. But one morning, she felt a familiar tickle. The sunlight played on her face for a moment, and it made her smile. An energy she hadn't felt in some time lifted her out of bed, and she sensed something familiar, and yet somehow it was new. And that day was more ordinary than most, but from time to time, more ordinary than not, but from time to time she was filled with hope, which rose in waves and then disappeared into the ordinary. She went to bed that night happier than usual, but slightly confused at what the day had been about. The next day dawned, and the woman, again, sensed something familiar and exciting in the sunlight, 
In fact, she felt so alive in that moment that she danced out of bed and down the hall, silently so no one would hear her. And moments in the day found her quietly humming to herself, dancing in her dreams, while she lived the life she thought she should. She went to bed that night not as anxious to sleep, as anxious to be awake again. The months went on that way with joy, dancing just below the surface of the woman. As the years went by, the woman became bolder, discovering things about herself she had somehow forgotten. She spent time every day, hungrily, uncovering pieces of a little girl from long ago. She decided she could no longer only be the person others expected to see. She was that, but she was so much more. She had always been so much more. She decided to share who she was with the world and with herself. There was magic to be remembered. And there was that urgent and now familiar rhythm that kept her dancing and looking for new songs to sing. Some people didn't really like that. They had come to depend on her the way she used to be, and now she made some of them uncomfortable, even angry. Are people really supposed to listen to their own rhythm and dance, they asked? Or should they march in the quiet lines laid out for them? Didn't matter to her. She didn't want to tell anyone else what to do. The only thing that mattered to the woman was the voice of the little girl living in her heart, whispering softly that she was indeed enough. She was magnificent, and she sparkled. So, that is, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so that, you know, it's like that, that book that showed up in my lap over the course of five years is the, it's kind of the fulcrum in some ways for me. It's like there's a before and an after for me. Um, before that, I thought the issue was that I wasn't like, wasn't like everybody else. But the, is, the issue was that I was trying to be like everybody else, and I was so beautifully, perfectly different. And so I, am, I, I would offer that to you because that is how we are of service, is by knowing who we are. And I know this is a stretch, it's been a stretch for me, but loving who you are and moving it out into the world. And there are so many ways to do that, but here's, here's one, of, one of my many mantras in my life. One is I'm a selfish quitter, so watch out, I could be quitting any time. No, one, one actually, one of my mantras really is I'm a selfish quitter because I feel like we don't do enough quitting in this world. We, don't, we tend to go, oh, I signed up for that, I better just follow through, or oh, I got that job, I better just stick with it, or I, instead, instead I, I, I ask you to listen to yourself. And I've listened to myself so many times where it's like, I don't want to get up. I don't want to get up. It's Monday morning. I don't want to get up. I want to, I want to stay in bed. I want to feel my freedom. And it, those kinds of feelings are there for a reason as, high as I see the world. The feelings are there to say, this isn't for you. <laughs> You're supposed to be feeling a sense of purpose and IntelliKey and joy. Not all the time. Dear God, we're living in the world, right? But at least, let's give us a 51 percentage kind of a thing, at least. You know? So I'm a selfish quitter. That's one of them. The other one is, what is the least you can do when we're talking about service in the world? I don't want to inspire anyone to think like, well, if you're going to be in service to the world, you got to go out there and you got to found a nonprofit, and you got to gather hundreds of, not thousands of people around you, and you have to make change that way. Go ahead, if that's part of who you are, please, please do that. But sometimes I think as human beings, we tend to use that as a reason not to do things. You know, you look out into the world and you see all these big things that have been happening, that people are trying to solve huge problems, and God bless them. We can't look at that and go, well, they're doing it. I don't have to worry about it, or oh, I could never do that big a thing. Think, what's the least you can do? What is the least 
you can do. Doesn't that sound easier? <laughs> you know, I'm not asking you to, to, to go out and do anything spectacular today. I'm asking you to feel into who you are and to operate in the world with just the slightest bit more of kindness. Just the slightest bit more. If you're an introvert, you don't have to walk through Target and Walmart with a great big old teasy grin on your face. That's my job. <laughs> you know, so if you, see, if you see me in Target, just smile back, for goodness sakes, please. Because so, so oftentimes I get one of those like, oh, God, what is she? <laughs> you, know, you know, hold your children tighter. What is she doing? She's smiling at me. But, but if you're an introvert, What's the least you can do? The least you can do is to recover yourself, honor yourself, send yourself a kind thought, and hear it, and know that it's true. Sit on your front porch and offer a kind thought to the world. You know, the world is made up of in-breaths and out-breaths. And I think sometimes we get stuck in one or the other. But just think, like, you, if you tried to take an in-breath and just kept taking an in-breath and just kept taking an in-breath and just kept taking an in-breath, it's like at some point you were either going to explode or hyperventilate or something. You need to have the out-breath. But the out-breath doesn't come with a prescription from me as to how the out-breath looks. The out-breath will look like who you are. You know, there's a, um, a guy I, I, I have to bring up almost every time I speak, um, and his name is Dr. David Hawkins. How many, has anybody read? Yeah, he's, his books are like crazy deep and dense, so sometimes it's hard to, for me to, to understand, but I've, I've, I've been reading his books and listening to his speeches for a long time, and he passed, I don't know, maybe five years ago. But I had the opportunity to spend some time with him while he was still here with us. And he, just to introduce him, he's, he was, he was this, he's this little elfin man. Just he's maybe this tall and gray hair and cute little beard and just the best laugh in the world. Um, and he, he's an orthomolecular psychiatrist. So extremely brainy, co-authored books with Linus Pauling, you know, back in the day. He had the largest psychiatric practice in Manhattan back in the day. And then he had a spiritual experience that he, it needed explaining to him. So he quit his psychiatric practice and he got into his little red truck and he drove across the country to Sedona and he spent approximately 20 years just like, what happened? <laughs> what, what was that? Probably a lot more scientific than that, but, but basically, he was trying to apply his scientific principles to his experience, trying to figure out what happened, how the world really works. And the conclusion that he came to was that one, one, conscious, loving human, one, can balance out 750,000 who are not conscious and loving. Isn't that stunning? You, doing your work, remembering who you are, being conscious in your life, and continuing to grow in that way, it's not something you need to apologize for wasting your time over here that you're not out you know, doing. Doing is awesome. Volunteering is awesome. Do it. But you're not wasting your time when you're sitting on your own and you're wondering about life and you're trying to find a way to evolve and move forward in the most loving of ways. It's not a waste of time. You could be balancing out 750,000 People who are not. And if you look at the world now, if you watch the news, which I don't, but if you watch the news, you will see we could use a little balance. And even if it's in the smallest of ways, it's like Dr. Hawkins said, you could sit on your front porch. You could sit in your rocking chair on your front porch and be conscious and loving. 
and shift the world. It isn't that you're going out there and tapping people on the shoulder and trying to convert them into anything. You're just being conscious and loving. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his because I, um, I'm lazy <laughs> in almost every aspect of my life other than this. This is my, this is, this is my passion. This is, this is what, what feeds me. And um, I'm also a distiller by nature. I mean, it worked out really well in television news because you'd go out and you'd, you know, you could be shooting television interviews for five, six hours, and then you'd come home, that's not home, come back to Care 11, you'd sit in the edit booth and that five or six hours would be brought down to a minute, or a minute and 10, or a minute and 20 seconds. So distilling was absolutely, it had to be a part of it. Um, but it's, it's part of my nature too. And when, I would look at the world, you know, I, you, you have this desire to solve it, if, don't, don't you? You know, looking out in the world, don't you feel like, oh, if only there were a solution to this. But it's so complicated and so big and so chaotic, it's like, what could you possibly do? You've got a tool, and it's you. You've got capacity, and it's what you were gifted with. It's your IntelliKey. So when I boiled it down to the, I thought I had boiled it down to the smallest place and I came to peace, like finding peace within yourself was, was the way forward to, to solve this massive problem. Individually, all of us finding peace. But peace is a word that people couldn't latch onto or they had an argument with or there was something that was there that didn't exactly feel right to people. And a few years ago, it became kindness, because to me that's the action word for peace. So that is my invitation. There's so many invitations here. But to, to consider kindness as a way to, to soothe the world, to be the balm that we all need. Um, get to know people. Um, you are more likely to be kind if you have an idea of what their story is. In fact, um, my husband and I were down in um, Davenport, Iowa. I had a speech down in Davenport, or in Moline, across the river. And um, it's a beautiful little, little city. I looked at a lot of people's eyes and had a lot of conversations. And then we left. And then this last Tuesday, the levee broke. They're right on the Mississippi River. And the whole downtown area where we were staying in Davenport, Iowa is underwater. They were rescuing people. Because I knew them, it meant something to me. It meant more to me. It would have meant something to me anyway, but it meant more to me. So just, I just tell you that as a way to just remind you to, you know, allow room and space to hear other people's stories and to to feel into other people's lives because all of a sudden there will be a different connection to that, that human being that you maybe wouldn't have had before. Um, but kindness, yeah. So the smallest thing you can do, I think, to change the world is kindness. There is an old French proverb that I think is brilliant. It says, if everybody swept in front of their own door, the world would be clean. Isn't that cool? If everybody swept in front of their own door, the world would be clean. So we can't spend our time going, well, I'll, I'll clean my front steps when she cleans her front steps, or wait till that person does, and then I can step in, and then I can do what I know to be right. It's like, no, you can't wait for everybody else to do it. Even if they're not sweeping their front steps, you get out there and you do it yourself, you know? I've had the thought that crossed my mind um, uh, it crosses my mind a lot, actually. Uh, walking in the world as though you and only you were responsible for the healing of it. I mean, what if that was the case? What if only you were responsible for it? Would you walk in the world differently? Would you walk in the world with greater kindness, with greater connection, with greater love? Because you were the one. Um, I wish I could remember his name now, but there was a, 
a Native American chief who, who basically offered up that idea and he said, did you think you were put here for anything less? Is how it ended. So maybe you're the one. What if you're the one to walk in the world like you're the one? I, um, I started doing more with kindness about two and a half years ago. It was shortly after the election. I started posting. I was going to run away from Facebook at the time because, because it was so scary. And I thought, oh, these angry people couldn't possibly be the people I live in the world with. You know, it was such a shock to me. And I was going to run away from Facebook at the time. And in, instead, I just had this epiphany. It's like, it's not my job to run away. It's my job to, to drop something different into it. So I started posting every day about, about kindness and the smallest, smallest, smallest things that you can do. Look at one another, smile at one another, offer a kind thought. Like when you drive down the street, it's so much fun to bless people. <laughs> bless people, you know? Instead of, instead of getting, you know, it's like, well, they, look at them, they don't know how to drive. What are they, she took a left turn, they were supposed to be a right, you know, the, all that stuff that crosses our mind. It's like, just get in the habit of going, ah, oh, bless you. You probably, you know, you probably need it. Bless you. <laughs> um, so the, the, the kindness, um, I just started posting about that and, and I was um, shocked, shocked to find out that people were thirsty for that on some level because all of a sudden people were going, your kindness project, your kindness project, your kindness project. It's like, it's not a project, it's just me trying to right the world that I'm looking at in some way. Um, so uh, looking for things to do, I, um, my husband and I went out and started interviewing kids, five-year-olds to 12-year-olds about the concept of kindness, about the ac actual activity of kindness. And we only have about nine so far. We're hoping to get more. But we talked to kids. We didn't pre-interview them. We didn't tell them specifically what we were talking about. They knew kind was going to be in there. So all of the stuff that I'm going to show you that you will hear are kids just c tapping into their own source of wisdom. And it's there. Um, the first one that you're going to see is a young man by the name of Jeremiah, and he's 12 years old, who is about to graduate from this academy called the Love Works Academy. And, and he literally had no warning. They, we were looking for somebody else to interview, and they pulled him out of the hallway. And this is what he had to say. We called him. I know. Oh. Shoot. I have... I also, we all, I, first of all, I love those kids. I love, love, love those kids. And isn't it amazing that we didn't, we didn't prompt them really in any way other than asking them a question and asking for their own wisdom. They have the wisdom, and the wisdom is simple. The wisdom is, if somebody falls down, pick them up. If somebody is, is sad, go over and put your arm around them. It's like it's not big stuff. It doesn't have to be big stuff. And uh, so I was just so, so impressed with them. And if you, if you want to see those, um, you can go to YouTube. And uh, it's kinder, a hopeful idea. But for those of you who, who like wordplay, it's kinder also, a hopeful idea. <laughs> so, um, so I'd love if you'd go and take a look at the rest of them. They're, they're all wonderful. Um, and also, I've, I've been for quite a while getting these cards printed up just to, for me to give to somebody when I see them. If somebody just smiles at me or offers me some sense of, of I see you or comfort or something. Like I was at, um, oh God, what, Taco Libre the, the other night. In, and like the, the man behind the register, I think he was glowing. I'm not exactly sure what his secret was, but I think it might be kindness. Because he was so helpful and so kind, and you just felt like he was there to take care of you and your cheese sauce, and that was all he had to, <laughs> to, to worry about. And um, I ended up having a fairly long conversation with him, and, and I just said, thank you so much, and I handed him one of these cards, and, and, um, and he, he said, I, I do it because the world needs it. And, you know, he hasn't got the best job in the world. He is, you know, but he's decided that it's going to be a job that makes a difference. 
And I think people who stand behind cash registers and who take orders, the people who touch the most of us, are the people that we really, we need to honor because they're the ones who kind of weave our culture together with their energy. So I really want to say I, I honor them. Um, I do have those with me, so if you'd like uh, a few of them to have in your own life, please come up and, and see me afterwards, and I'll, I have a couple of boxes. Um, so I, remember who you are. Who you are has a purpose, and it's unique, and it's brilliant, and, and it shifts the world. Remember who you are. It's worth the effort to remember who you are. Maybe spend some time in silence and, you know, every day and just kind of remember what makes you happy, what keeps you joyful, what keeps you moving ahead. Remember who you are, and then be who you are, because being who you are is... It's important. It also takes a lot of courage in this world because the world would kind of like you to be like everybody else. And if you somehow show yourself in a different way, the world can be like the, you know, the mom at Target, like, get away from that woman. But be who you, be who you are. Have the courage to, if you feel like you want to reach out and say, oh my gosh, you look so beautiful today, even if you don't know the person. If you feel that, do it. Have the courage to do it. It, it, it makes a difference. And when you remember who you are and you be who you are, there is this automatic need to share who you are, um, I think. Um, because you're coming from this place of, of the most beautiful kind of power. Um, and it won't always be there, and some days you won't want to. But that's okay, too. You get to be human. You don't have to be perfect, but just share who you are. And when you share who you are, that's what shifts the world. And is there anybody in here who doesn't think the world needs just a little shifting right now? Just a little. I will close with a quote from a man who was an author, a mathematician, a logician, a minister, and an author. He said, I know what the issue in the world is. Everybody wants a magical solution to everything. And everyone refuses to believe in magic. <laughs> you are the magic. Your energy is the magic. You are the magic wand. You are magic. Hello, everybody. <sighs> On this Sunday, I, I can't help but think and um, feel something extra about Justine. So, um, I think about what she left in this space. And she would always bring knowledge that was interesting. But that knowledge could have come from a book. But the way Justine brought it into this place was with joy and enthusiasm and humor and goofiness. And I just want to take um, both a moment to honor that energy that um, remains in this room because her book is not finished. A chapter may be closed, but the book is still open. And she continues to shift and help us all to, and even this city, to grow. So I'd like to just offer a couple of loving breaths for Justine and to surround Don and her family. and the city and the community that we all live in. 
And I, I, I feel like we should end it with a laugh, so if you've got one, I would appreciate it, because Justine, Justine, Justine um, loved to laugh. So, <laughs> so um, just blessings go out from us to her and them and to all of us in our community. So bless us all. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>